everyone, and welcome to another Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous with Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo. And today I'm going to go back to my state of the game format for this episode because I've been doing a lot of schoolwork and stayed away from most of the updates that happened in the past 30 days. Now, Star Citizen 3.3.6 has hit the PU, and I will say this, it might be the best thing that's ever happened to those of us that love to alpha test the game, but it is by no means a way for people to get in the game and start playing and enjoying as if it was a release. It is buggy, there's graphical glitches, there's frame rate slowdowns, there's... Well, there's a whole bunch of things that just aren't working, but we've been used to that since the beginning, and this is a huge step forward for those of us that have been playing the game for quite a bit. Now, you might be asking why I'm sitting over here on Port Olisar when the place to be is Lorville. Well, I've been flying a whole bunch of, well, many different ships back and forth between Lorville and Port Olisar to figure out what the differences are in times to get from A to B. So the trip out here from Lorville took about 16, 17 minutes. And I started to wonder, going, why is it taking so long? And then I remembered. Each ship is going to have a different jump drive, and each jump is going to take a different amount of time, considering the size of the jump drive, the size of the ship, the quality of the jump drive, the class of the jump drive. So many things going on that I had to start doing a few tests. Now, that trip was in a prospector, which is a fair bit smaller and uses a fair bit smaller jump drive. And I'm sure it uses a lower quality. I'm not sure if it uses civilian, industrial, or if it's using military. I'm sure it is not. Anyway, I did a few jumps back and forth, and I found that the longest jump was in my prospector. I did three jumps. The second longest was in my arrow. And then the quickest jump drive out of all the ships I have, or the quickest jump out of all the ships I have, was in this, the 600. This is a Speed Demon. Now I'm talking about this because in the state of the game, I want to talk about times it takes to get somewhere to do something. So say you want to go on a cargo run. Say you want to go and work on some ECN. Say you want to go and work on some investigation missions. All of them are going to have to be done in the Crusader system and around Delamar right now. And I separate those two because some people still think that Delamar is within the Crusader system. And it's not. It's more like a planetoid. It's more like Cirrus, that, that huge asteroid that's in our solar system. It's not orbiting around any planet. It's actually orbiting around the sun. So I wanted to make sure that there was a, a clear understanding to me how long it was going to take to do actual missions. Now, travel times are a problem. And they're a problem in many games. And many games implement things like mounts, being able to fly places, being able to teleport places. Inside of fi um, Fallout 76 and Fallout 4, you could actually fast travel to places to get to the action or get home a lot quicker. But in Star Citizen, realism needs to be maintained. So you need to fly each way to and from wherever your missions are going to be. On top of that, you have to wake up somewhere, whether it be on your ship, at one of the stations, or in one of the habitats on Lorville. And that means traveling either down the stairs and over to the vehicle selection terminal and then out the door, or in the case of Lorville, out of your habitat down the stairs, into another area, down more stairs, around corners, over to a train, on the train, to the spaceport. You get my gist. Travel times are going to be an issue. Now, I thought the travel time in Lorville was going to be a big issue at first, and it's not. It actually helps to build on the realism of the game. The travel times between planetary systems, they're trying to do it based on real-life mathematics. 
and I think they were trying to use point one, point two, point three, point four C as a way to come up with how fast they want to travel. And then they have distances set on how far these these objects are from each other. And then you actually travel in real time from A to B. And, well, this can be rather a detraction. It could be a negative for people that want to get into the game, especially today's generation, and just start shooting things. Now, for those people, I just recommend go play Pirate Swarm or Vandal Swarm and have fun. But the distances that are in this game, how long it takes to get from A to B, is actually something that is going to hurt the player base eventually. Now, I don't know how to keep the realism, keep things in check, and at the same time, make it fun. Now, for me to leave this here, I'll give you an idea. I'm looking at time codes right now. We are now at the six minute time code. So how long did I say this went on for? I believe it goes on for about six or eight minutes, and we will check that out in just a second. So we were at the six minute mark before, and we moved all the way up to the 12 minute mark right about five and a half minutes. And that's how long this jump took. Now that's in a 600, the fastest ship that's in the game. But even after you jump, you then have to go the hundred or so kilometers down to the ground. And that in itself is gonna take quite a bit of time. So I've cut this video and we're starting our trek down to the surface right around at the seven, seven minute and 10 second mark. So I'm gonna cut here and I'm gonna move forward. In this cut, it took us all the way to the 1924, 19 minutes and 24 seconds. That's 12 minutes and 14 seconds it took us to get to this very spot. So when you couple that with six minutes before, that's 20 minutes of traveling before you even get anywhere. And that's if your mission is taking you from Port Olazar to Lorville with cargo. If my mission is taking me from Port Olazar to Lorville to meet somebody to give me a mission, that's going to mean that I'm going to need a good two to three hours of gameplay to actually do something in the game each night. And that, to me, may be a bit much. And I'm thinking that that could be a huge distractor or detractor for people that are beginning to play this game. Now, in some ways, I feel that that's cool. I'm a person that plays X-Plane, and that's all about the travel time. But that is a flight simulator. Now, this is an MMO. RPG type game and a space simulator all in one. And I'm wondering if that is something that other people are going to be playing the game are going to like. In the grand scheme of things, I think the game is amazing. But I'm not sure if there are many people that are going to follow on with that mentality that I have. All right, we're going to go from here. We're going to go inside the space port, TISA space port. Let me go and make sure that I send my elevator back up, and we'll go inside. Now, as this is a live MMORPG game, CIG has said in the past that they would have many live events, and in this case, we're going to the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo. And for us, we're going to try to go to all the different halls. Now, I do make a mistake on this elevator. This gentleman pushed the button first. And when we actually get off of the elevator, we are going to be in the wrong floor. I was trying to go to the Idris Pavilion, but we wound up here on the, I guess we we're on floor A. 
And this is the brand new era that's in front of us, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. This live event is a first shot, and it looks like it was put together rather quickly, as there are many expo exhibits where tails or wings of the starships have been pushing through the back wall. But as a first try, they pretty much did a great job. I'm finding that there could have been a little bit more a little bit more emphasis on the products themselves with actual speakers in front of each one. Maybe ones that weren't speaking, but you could walk up to and say, hey, tell me about the ship. How much does this ship cost? Why would I buy this ship? You know, have like one or two of the Q&A questions built into one of the NPCs. But that's always something they could do later, not something that they should focus their time on when the game is still in alpha. But if you haven't purchased any of these ships, coming out here, it, it's, it's a great forum for you to come out with your friends and talk about all the different ships that your favorite companies might make. Now, I know this is coming to you long after the first four expos are over. I do want to point out, however, that there are going to be many more expo days, and there is a possibility that later on, they'll have all the floors open at once. They proved that they could do more than one floor today when they have three floors of AGS Dynamics. Now, Aegeus Dynamics makes some of, the, some of my favorite ships, from the Vanguard to the Gladius to the Sabre and Sabre Ravens to that wonderful, amazing, huge hammerhead. But at this expo, you're also going to be able to see the Idris M. Now, I know that CIG is trying to keep the look and feel of the Idris M from us meaning the interior views, not the exterior views. Everyone knows what it looks like outside, and that's mainly because next year, this time next year, when we're all playing Star Citizen's wonderful single-player campaign game called Squadron 42, we will be able to walk all over that ship and interact with all those wonderful characters that we've been seeing. But currently, all they're doing is letting us see the outside. Hopefully next year, when it's almost time for release, or maybe shortly after release, we'll be able to come out to this expo floor, wherever it might be held next year, and be able to get on the address and walk through it. As I'm sure there's going to be some Star Citizen fans that don't play through Squadron 42, and who you are, I don't know, but I'm sure some of you will exist. But I find this ship to be tremendous and you really needed to get into third person view to see the size of this ship. Now I hope the next time they do this they have a huge outside landing platform where you can see it with a lot more room around it. In fact next year I hope that they do some kind of an outdoor expo, something like an air show where they have an elite group of of UEE Navy Marine and Marine Corps pilots doing an air show. That would be awesome. Kind of like going to see the Blue Angels. That gun is tremendously big. Everybody would think that's the nose of the ship, but that's actually the mass driver that's underneath the ship. Oh, sorry, the rail gun that's underneath the ship that is hugely destructive and can take out, well, we don't know what it can take out yet. We will wait for that to be seen when we start playing the game, and when some of the elite few who have this ship begin to bring it out into the PU. And now is the time for us to look at the next and most important part of the update, new flyable ships. Now we've already looked at the Mustang and all the other ships like the Hammerhead that came in 3.3. But 3.3.5 didn't have any ships listed as coming out. However, like they did at CitizenCon, CIG gave us a surprise. And they have another surprise coming too on the 28th, and we'll talk about that then. The surprise here was that they had a new flyable ship that was for sale, this time 65 US dollars for the ship alone. 
and that's a war bond edition which means new cash only you can get it for 75 i believe with paying in credit and then you can get an 80 dollar war bond version that actually has the game with it so it would be a ship package this is the anvil arrow and to me this would be kind of like the F-22. It's tiny, it's stealthy, it's fast, and it hits hard. And it feels like a race car when you get inside of it. This is what I've been the most impressed with. And even though it's small, sleek, and beautiful, it still has that same look and feel that every Anvil ship has. Now that I'm in my flight suit and ready to go let's get this baby up into space and see what she could do travel times come into play here again as it took me 12 minutes to get from the surface all the way to here well that's only because i had so much fun flying around hurston i took about an eight minute joyride and then it only took me four minutes to get out of the atmosphere so it did move pretty quickly Quantum Jump is amazing in this thing, but again, when did we start Quantum Jump? At 16, let's jump ahead and see how long it takes to get to Delamar. And that was another 12 minutes of my life spent traveling around the Stanton system. Now, I, I'm not complaining here. This is pointing things out. We need to know how long it takes to get from A to B in the different ships, so when we go to do something, we know which ones are the right ones to choose. Right now, if you have an Origin 600, that's the one that you promise to take people back and forth in if there's no mission. Say you have to go pick somebody up over at Port Alisar and you're at Lorville. It would take you less time to take off, go pick them up, and bring them back to Lorville than it would be to, say, them jump into their Hornet or into a Mustang Alpha or an Aurora, if that's all they have, because not everybody has all the ships that I do. So let's jump ahead to why we took the Arrow out, because the Arrow is a light fighter. It's in the same class as the Gladius and the Mustang Delta, and it is amazing. So the Mustang Delta has been one of my favorite ships for quite a long time because you have huge firepower. You have exceptional maneuverability. You have amazing acceleration. And it had a awesome look until they broke it for me. Now I'm starting to fall in love with the Mustang again. But this ship is beginning to give me the willies. I mean, not the willies. It really is an amazing ship to play and it is so maneuverable and I really need to turn ESP well ESP on from time to time I don't think I have it on here and then after a while everything breaks you're gonna find that right now I should have been able to kill the ship a lot quicker but I just couldn't keep my pipper on the target for whatever reason but I have found after the first run of ships that came through here very quickly this this encounter broke and most of the ships just didn't fire on you or they didn't turn or they just sat in front of you which gave me an opportunity to see how quickly I could blow something up and let me tell you this thing was able to blow a Connie up pretty fast now, you don't have heavy weapons on this at all you do have six missiles and you do have a couple of laser repeaters and a couple of other weapons of your choice so it's not an exceptional loadout. I would say it's closer to the Gladius Valiant than it is anything else. But it's fun, and I'm in an Anvil ship. And I'm in an Anvil ship that doesn't have the normal Anvil characteristics of being able to take a huge amount of damage. In fact, I'm in an Anvil ship that's more like an Aegeus Dynamics ship. Because it is light, maneuverable, and can fall apart in an instant. I have taken this into the... I guess it wasn't Pirate Swarm, it was Vandal Swarm. And I would get blown up if I accidentally flew into one of the scythes or one of the glaives. But I was okay flying through a blade from time to time. This is where things started to break. And... 
we get enough shots in on this guy, but what I'm trying to do is keep the maneuvering so I keep... Oh, what the hell is going on there? Told you I'd been sick the last few days, but I guess I just couldn't get enough shots on this guy to take him out. Mouse and keyboard players would have killed this guy already. There it goes. He's gone. Alright, so you got to see two of the kills. Alright, so I'm going to close this one out by saying 3.3.6 is fun to play for those of us that have been in the game for quite a while. If you're brand new to Star Citizen and you're looking for a game, 3.3.6 does not give you a game. It still gives you a basic understanding of where Star Citizen is going in the future. It gives you some basic gameplay elements. The patch also brings you a huge amount of eye candy and gives you an opportunity to meet with your friends and have some fun in some immersive gameplay that Chris Roberts is calling emergent gameplay, meaning you create what you do inside of it. There are races that go on and now there's going to be a lot more of that going on. There are people that get into their hammerheads and go out for huge battles. So you can make a lot of fun in the game now. But as a game that offers you structure and things to do and ways to make money, that's not what is happening right now. All right, folks, as always, if you like the video, please click the thumbs up button below. If you do subscribe, be sure to click the notification button. It looks like a bell and that will keep you updated on all of my videos as they come out. And for those of you that want to go more, there's always patreon.com forward slash Batgirl. There you can help the channel grow. As far as growing, it will continue to grow now that school is out in one week. I am going to be back with a vengeance and we will have one of the best years in Star Citizen coming up because next year this time will be in Squadron 42. Oh yes, I might not know, but I have a feeling. I have a feeling deep down that it is definitely coming out. And with that said, folks, you all be safe out there, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.